request all the participants to turn on their webcams. Good morning, Dr. Maria. Oh, yes, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Sorry. How are good you doing morning. today? Well, everything is good. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, good morning. Uh, I would like to request all the participants to rename their Zoom accounts in their English name so that we can record your presence. Okay, uh, so good morning, Mosh. How are you doing today? Can you hear me? Uh, good morning, Zareen. Could you hear me, Zareen? Zareen Bibu John. Okay, so we are uh, having a little bit uh, delay. I would like to request all the participants to turn on their webcams and also to rename their Zoom accounts with their English name, full name in English, so that we can record your presence. Uh, good morning, Asmin, Asmadi Idris. How are you doing today? Good morning. Morning, fine. Although so Malaysia are... is afternoon, afternoon time. Afternoon time. Okay, so good afternoon yeah. to you. So yeah. how is the weather in your country right now? In your city? Fine, fine. How is the weather in your city right now? It's good. It's good, okay. Yeah. And uh, Mosh Zedna, how is the weather in your city? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, reasonably well, as you well know, we're in okay. the middle of a crisis situation here in Israel, and uh, yeah. we're holding on. So I'm speaking to you from my home bunker, and let's hope for peace for the whole region. Yeah, yeah. We hope that the situation of crisis gets over soon for you also and for the world. So exactly. thank you for joining today. It's a great pleasure to have you with us. Uh, Zareen, could you hear me? Recording is starting. Uh, Zareen, Vibojian, could you hear me? Okay. So we will start with the uh, Conference now. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to Eurasia Research Online Live International Conference. It's a great pleasure for us to have you today. The event is about to start. Please wait, we will, be, we will begin shortly. Today we have presentations and participants from nine countries around the world and we are broadcasting this conference on Facebook Live on multiple pages of Eurasia Research. The links for the live sessions are shared in the chat box. You can refer those links to your friends, colleagues. So uh, the participants from the nine countries around the world are from Philippines, Oman, India, Israel, Spain, USA, Mauritius, Malaysia and Brazil. Before I start with the conference, I would like to explain Eurasia research to all of you in a nutshell. Welcome to the Eurasia Research International Conference. With over more than 1 million satisfied members and associates spread across the globe, Eurasia Research is a scholarly association who have been working for nearly a decade. Eurasia Research has organized several successful international conferences, workshops, and training programs at various separated institutions and grand venues. Eurasia has been tirelessly working for research world 
and have not stopped their endeavors even during covid era and have presented research community with an online platform which was safe and convenient method to continue their passion we are an international community of researchers practitioners students and educationists who aim to bring together worldwide researchers and professionals encourage intellectual development and to create for uh, create opportunities for networking and collaboration these objectives are achieved through academic networking meetings conferences workshops projects research publications academic awards and scholarships some of our main highlights are that we provide scholarship to deserving candidate to promote students and young research scholars to participate in the international conferences young researcher scholarship is provided in the form of a full registration fee waiver we have vast experience of publishing papers for more than 7 years our associated journals publish original papers review papers conceptual framework analytical and simulation models case studies empirical research technical notes and book reviews we cater to more than 30 plus themes in the area of teaching and education and have registered issn and have following renowned indexing google scholar crosscheck authenticate crossref the keepers registry script portico road directory of open access scholarly resources oai pmh registered data provider and pkp index we will soon be applying for scopus 2 we have a wide network of 100 plus internationally acclaimed keynotes across the globe who share their knowledge and guidance with our participants with open hands we have a large number of committee members and advisors who support us and guide us through their expert opinions and decision making capabilities we couldn't have thought of reaching here without them we also encourage our participants to connect with more than 50k plus followers on our social media platform where they can share their research and interests join our facebook group and be a part of the discussions by researchers and academicians we also have several collaborations with universities colleges and institutes to better serve all interested and like minded intellectuals with great enthusiasm and pride we would like to announce our latest project which is the terra fellow program in education this program offers an opportunity to learn the key concepts and latest trends in the teaching industry from the academic stalwarts we would like to share some of our past participant experience with you thank you for your patience and valuable time moving ahead with the conference now I will be your today's host, and my name is Divya Devnani. So we will start with the conference now. First, I would like to introduce all of you to our Terra President, Dr. Len M. Chelly, PhD, Higher Education Executive, retired adjunct professor, Boston College, Chestnut Hill, MA, USA. My name is Dr. Lynn Chelly, and I'm the Dean of Graduate and Professional Studies at LaSalle University in Newton, Massachusetts, United States of America. I'm proud to be coming to you and bringing you this video on behalf of EurAsia Research and Terra Teaching and Education Research Association. I have been a privileged member of this association for many years as a participant as a speaker as a keynote speaker as a peer reviewer as the president of the advisory board i'm here to welcome you and encourage you to participate in this wonderful organization membership has its privileges for this organization you meet wonderful diverse people from all over the world that bring new and creative innovative and entrepreneurial perspectives in teaching and educational research terra is a wonderful 
place to be as a participant. I encourage you to join and become a member. I also encourage you to submit proposals to do breakout sessions. They are the most valuable and rewarding professional experience you could ever have. As importantly, Eurasia Terra does organize their conferences, both virtual and in person, in such a way where you get to know people personally, know their work, know their research, and get to know them as people, which is most important in our business, relationships. It has expanded my horizons, expanded my professional growth and development, and I continue to look forward to being part of this wonderful organization. Part of attending a conference in person, whether you're a participant or you're an observer, you get to interface and interact on social levels as well as academic levels with everyone involved. We stay in touch after conferences. We share research. We help one another become better at what we do, become better in our educational professions, become better in our research. Again, membership has its privileges. The networking is amazing. Expanding your skill set is amazing. It keeps you in the growth mindset, which we always should be in as educators. And every conference, as I said, has a variety of perspectives that it brings for every person in attendance, no matter what role you have. You will find many pearls of wisdom that you can bring back to your own work and apply immediately. So I encourage you to get in touch with me if you wish at Lynn, L-Y-N-N-E-C-E-L-L-I at gmail.com with any questions. And I also encourage you to visit the website so that you may be able to see exactly not only the professional growth we have, but such fun we have with the relationship building. I look forward to seeing you at another conference and a new conference and hopefully meeting you personally and professionally. Thank you so much, Dr. Len Shelley. So next we have our eminent speaker. She has also been our previous past uh, conferences participant, uh, Juliana Borges Lopez, Faculty of Education, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, uh, Brazil. So I am pedagogue from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Um, I studied five years in the Faculty of Education of the Federal University of Rio. Um, and during this time, I participated of two different programs, one for um, initiation in research and one for initiation in teaching. Um, and then I started doing my research on early childhood education um, and I wrote the I presented the, a research entitled A Musical Perspective of Pedagogical Improvisation in Early Childhood Education, mm -hmm. which came from my uh, dissertation from uh, uni. So during pandemic, I attended an, um, an online conference as well. But this time it was in-person conference and I have to say that it felt completely different. I love to be able to experience it in person. Of course that I'm, I'm from Brazil, so 
sometimes the only way that you can do it is online. Because just like right now, we're in different countries and doing uh, like talking together. And I think online conferences are good because of that. But yeah, that was something about the in-person conference that was very good as well. Yes, I think um, especially because of the this cultural exchange that an online conference can uh, bring to you. So you can um, li like live talk to, talk to people that are in completely different cultures and contexts. So yeah, I, I would definitely recommend um, to have this experience as a researcher or like as an educator in general. For me, it was, um, the conference was held in, in London and I was already going to London. So it was the perfect timing to um, meet people from different countries. And I actually met like an educator from Israel, another one from South Africa, from Ghana, from um, India, from London. So I think this brought me a different uh, perspective of education and brought me some possibilities of thinking in a different way. Thanks so much, uh, Guliana Borges Lopez, for sharing your feedback with us. So our next eminent speaker of the day is Charat Katapan, Graduate Education, Sharon La School of Education, Augustana University, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, USA. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Nikki Katapan. I am a research designer and a faculty at the uh, School of Education um, at Augustana University. Also, the uh, adjunct faculty for the doctoral program at UC of Louisiana at Monroe. Um, I am uh, so honored to be selected and I'm so honored to be here. During the pandemic, I had a chance to attend um, a couple of the UHA research um, sessions. And I have to say, I really like it because of flexibility. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have to travel to the conference site anymore. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I do miss the uh, um, the, 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 the charm, the, exactly okay. the charm of physical conference and the uh, opportunities to um, mm -hmm. explore the city that I can, um, you know, to yeah. go to attend the conference. Um, mm -hmm. That would be the only downfall. But other than that, I like the online conference because um, it's allow people to um, connect regardless of place and time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because many times you um, some uh, we cannot at travel to the conference site because of the budget problems. Right. And even after COVID, we can have a, a lot more mm -hmm. budget problems. So mm -hmm. I feel like online conference really helps a lot. But again, like I said, um, I miss the charm of being talking to people face to face. Yes, yes. Um, and the interactions will be probably a little bit low because, you know, when you um, when you do online conference, the, uh, mm -hmm. the interactions will be kind of you know a little bit lower than in person but we can try to improve that and uh, i have to say that um, all the conference provide more opportunities to um to attend i would say first that the uh, um they can do it in the um in the uh, in their own place like at their home at their office or wherever they want to choose without traveling to the conference site and and you know like for you Rishi, you you guys um you hold the conference in different countries. I like mm -hmm. that because it's allowed us to um, explore the cities that we've never been to. But mm -hmm. at the same time, the budget and the uh, you know money problems mm -hmm. um, can be can be can be you know can be uh, obstacles. Yeah, but but online conference really really helps um, us to connect mm -hmm. in this way. And I would encourage all of my um, peers um, to attend online conference and um, present at the online conference. It is as good as the physical um, conference. But just missing the uh, um, the, yes, the, the charming of the, you know, yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 the talking and the in-person mm -hmm. talking, but we can, um, what can I say, replicate that by using online um, talking instead. Um, my future plan, I'm looking into the uh, the new, um, into 
my new paper, the topic that I'm working on, and mm. um, I hope I'll be able to present it at uh, Eurasia Research again. Um, and in the same time, I am trying to what can I say, come up and uh, launch the the, the research I, that I um, have with Eurasia to and have my colleagues implement them, um, right. and have them understand that we, you know, as peers, we have to keep learning. We cannot stop. Once mm-hmm. we get the information, we cannot just stop here. We have to keep learning and make sure that we implement our research into our, into our future practice, so we can have better, you know, um, better education, better world, and better outcomes, and better student who will become, you know, the future generation. Thank you so much, uh, Nikki Charat Khatapan, for sharing your feedback with us. Moving ahead with the conference now. So our conference schedule is divided into th- three sessions. Session one, one will be keynote talk. Session two will be tea activity and photo session. And session three will be technical talk. I would like to request all the participants to rename their Zoom accounts with their full name in English. This will help us to record your presence. You may ask your questions related to the presentations in the chat section while the presentations are still going on. All the certificates, receipts, and proceedings will be sent to the participants within a week on their mail IDs. The proceedings will include all the full papers and abstracts accepted for the conference. Moving ahead with the publication process, the publication process starts when the registration process is over. The author needs to send their papers, consent forms, and review details on the given email ID on the screen. The review reports will be sent to the author once the review process is over. The final stage of publication starts after receiving the revised papers from the authors. Please note that the publication process takes around 50 days after the conference dates if all the editorial guidelines are followed within the given deadline. So we will start with the session one of the conference, that is the keynote session. Our first keynote speaker of the day is Dr. Florian Mobo, Department of Research and Development, Philippine Merchant Marine Editor-in-Chief, Zambal, Philippines. His topic of presentation is Emerging Technologies in Education. Dr. Florian Mobo is a Director of Public Administration, graduate from the Urdaneta City University, class of 2016 and a graduate of the second doctor, doctorate degree, PhD, in Development Education Program at the Central Luzon State University, Nova Ajia, uh, Philippines, class of 2022. After obtaining his doctorate degree, he was promoted and des- designated to the position of Assistant Director, Extension Coordinator, and Associate Professor of the Department of Research, Development, and Extension of the Philipp- Philippine Merchant Marine Academy. And this allowed him to work with different international research institutions, such as the director of the IKSAD Research Institute, Turkey, lecturer in the graduate school, Colombian College, Olongapo City, and at the president, Ramon uh, Maksese State University, Zambal. He was appointed editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Multidisciplinary Applied Business and Education Research, Malang, Indonesia, As a researcher by heart, he is an external peer review in various international journals. He has been invited as a keynote or resource speaker at various international conferences abroad and international universities around the globe. He was named an outstanding alumnus of the Graduate School of Urdenta City University, Pangas Sinan, in 2019 and a multi-awarded international researcher and global leader from 2020 to the present. Recently, he was appointed as the ambassador at large, country ambassador and director for the International Human Rights Movement, Philippines, under the umbrella of the United Nations. He has been appointed as a technical research evaluator by the Department of Science and Technology. He has published 90 research articles with 70 citations. He also published 12 international books in Europe, Indonesia and India. We welcome you, Dr. Frolin. Good evening, everyone. This is uh, Dr. Foylan D. Mobo uh, of the Philippines from the Department of Research, Development, and uh, Extension of the Philippine Merchant Marine Academy, 
So my task for tonight, so I welcome you all to the to this uh, conference. So my task for tonight, for tonight is to discuss about educational research amidst the global pandemic. So as we all know, research is very important and plays a vital role in this time of pandemic. So it's very important for us to adopt other um, learning methodologies, especially in adopting research in this uh, global platform. So my first is part, part of that is we need to have identify the emerging technology researches. For example, as we define technologies in the uh, present uh, situation and significance in, uh, in this field, uh, amidst the pandemic is this is to uh, help and support and uh, of course the situation that what we have so the purpose of this uh, emerging technologies this would be able to help uh, to adapt technologies and be able to help our economy to uh, go back the way it is before so part of that is we have to consider the emerging technologies part of this new uh, trend, especially in this time of pandemic, for example, shifting from the normal situation to the new situation. So part of that is uh, available in the near future and are still evolving and will impact in the future, especially using the emerging technologies in a uh, research uh, platform. So the uh, education trends in the 2020, especially in this time of pandemic is that most of the universities and even uh, colleges, uh, even uh, training centers, have already evolved and transcend and use uh, different platforms in uh, delivering their uh, educational and uh, presenting their research. For example, most of them are using now uh, Google Scholar or ResearchGate and other uh, ICT tools that can be used in a delivering quality research output, especially in uh, research. So as we, as you take a look in the screen, uh, you can easily uh, search uh, your research using this technology platform uh, using Google Scholar. So once you key in the keyword, definitely you would be able to check the uh, 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 citations, the input factor, and the updates which your research has been cited by a present author. And part of that, for the available technology for today, so technologies are plays a vital role that are new but are available today through an information technology support or a vendor's partner. For example, uh, Google Scholar is a free platform that can be used for doing research and uh, maximizing it the way it is. Instead of... Uh, looking for software which is paid or licensed you can also uh, use it use uh, other software to uh, for educational research uh, use so for example we have a graphical information system it is being defined that it is a system designed to capture store manipulate analyze manage and present all types of data a good example for that is google so Google Maps plays a vital role in capturing all the local of your study in your research can be uh, uploaded. Very, that is you're looking at absolutely. Part, for example, the data source from it will be um, guys, to, uh, capturing all the data, and then uh, part another technology that we can use is the voice over IP. For instance, this is a technology that allows you to make video calls just, just like what we're doing right now using uh, Zoom and other pla platforms, Google Meet. Okay, we can use this for uh, doing uh, data gathering or doing interview or uh, focus group discussion in terms of research. So that is the benefits of the BOIP or the voice over IP using emerging technologies in research. Then on the horizon, technologies that play a vital role are really new, especially in this time of pandemic, and are, and are also be used in other future uh, purpose. So for example, for the virtual networking, 
And the technology facilitates data communications between two or more virtual machines. And it can also be used for research presentation, just like what we're doing right now, for example, using Zoom, Google Meet, and other applications that can be done by doing uh, research conferences and presentation in a virtual mode, even, even if you will not go to the actual place. So cloud computing also plays a vital role because this is an on-demand ability of computer system that can be stored remotely. So you can store your, store your research or other data which is available and it can be downloaded anytime, anywhere. Just a single click, you can easily download, for example, your research and then it can easily be uh, indexed or it can, it can easily be cited. So part of this technology uh, we have the applications, platform infrastructure in doing the emerging, te emerging, te emerging technologies in education research when you do this. So it's, we need an infrastructure to do this uh, type of uh, emerging, emerging technologies in the research. And it plays a vital role, for example, in this time of pandemic, it is very important to adapt things which is really uh, part of the system. And we need to do this as part of the new normal uh, thing. So another is we have the web tip 2.0, which refers to the web system that emphasizes user generated content, which can be used for a participatory culture and interoperability for end user, which can also be used easily because of its interface, for example, uh, the use of Facebook or Google Scholar. So by using that, you can easily uh, do research by a key in the keyword. And of course, the future of data, uh, emerging technologies in the field of research focus on the cloud uh, that was started in the 2013, but it gave, it, it's being given emphasis in the 2015 and also in the 2018 by starting the usage of uh, artificial intelligence as part of their technology transformation. And so in the, uh, 2018 will be remembered as a landmark year in the history of data economy, which is marked by a dramatic increase of consumer awareness of the power, scope, and risk of corporate data strategies and by sweeping the old uh, way to regulatory environment in this time of pandemics. It's very important that even you are not really knowledgeable in ICT, you have to adapt things because this is our trend right now. In doing research, it's very important to know ICT uh, technology platforms, okay? And then the cloud grows up because uh, the based on the survey uh, that they have gathered, 200 business technology executives to better understand and how to employ this type of platform. So consistent with an earlier version of the same survey, the results show widespread enthusiasm in the cloud technology platform. So it's very important that we adopt this and use this, this, this type of uh, process. So example of emerging technologies uh, in the research is that is there example of emerging technology rather than the commonly used technology or part of in the future technology. In fact, many of them are still emerging years after the initial emergence and as it's the case with technologies like robotics, and artificial intelligence will continue to radically reshape themselves and thus continue emerging, uh, especially in this time of pandemic. So example of emerging educational technologies that I show to you on your screen is the audio uh, augmented reality or AR, which can be used in uh, delivering quality education, for example, in uh, practical cases or laboratory. We need to use augmented reality Plus the virtual reality to, to present the uh, uh, scenario. And of course, 3D printing, robotics, and adaptive learning algorithms that can be used for in doing research. For example, you can uh, do uh, searching for literature review by using Google Scholar, academia, and research as part of your technological platforms in doing research or uh, do. Uh, submission of those research. So we can also include asynchronous learning and micro learning and associated micro credentials uh, for 
uh, doing research, uh, especially uh, later or tomorrow, we'll be doing a presentation using this platform again. So live streaming, school to school, school to expert, remote teaching, and learning by Zoom and other uh, also uh, this type of platform. So AI has been there, social learning. So uh, obviously, uh, this is close uh, related to uh, blended learning from, uh, from asynchronous and asynchronous learning. So learning games and simulation also plays a vital role because this will develop the skill of the students to uh, respond on the global changes that we have right now. So educational technology trends between the, uh, two years ago, uh, we already, I mentioned already that we can use big data, machine learning, and of course the internet of things were the biggest uh, educational technology trends as of 2019. However, distance learning has become the one trend that closed them all. For example, that I want to uh, say is, for example, we have the University of the Philippines Open University. They're, they are already uh, using this platform as part of their delivering uh, quality education. So if someone asks you, uh, online education uh, really works, of course, the answer there is yes. So take note that as of now, we are still in the process of uh, doing things, adapting things. For example, the latest ed tech trends in the 2020 and four year into 2020 are being revolutionized with strong focus on connectivity, versatility, and student-centered learning. So what is important is so let's take a look at the latest top 10 trends in educational technology, okay? So it speaks to that one of the biggest barriers to incorporating emerging technologies in the classroom is fear on how to implement them. But since we already have a guidelines, it should be strengthened so that we can work out things which is really important. So I think that would be all. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to discuss about the future trends of research amidst the pandemic. So uh, thank you and a good afternoon to everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Solim. Thank you so much, Dr. Solin D. Mubu, for your wonderful presentation. I would like to request all the participants to uh, put their questions in the chat box. If there, uh, if any of the participants have any questions related to Dr. Solin's uh, presentation, they can put their questions in the chat box itself. So our next keynote speaker of the day is Dr. Maria Teresa Matriano, Assistant Professor, Department of Management Studies, Center for Postgraduate Studies, Doctor in Business Administration, MBA, Masters of Arts in Learning and Teaching, Middle East College, Al Rusoil, Knowledge Oasis, Muscat, Oman. Her topic of presentation is How Artificial Intelligence Will Transform Business. Dr. Maria, being an academician for 20 years, has been evolved both in university and collegiate teaching, research writing, and publication. She has served as a training institute administration, administrator for 20 years, drafting academic policies while doing collaboration with members of higher education. Dr. Maria has exp expertise in teaching entrepreneurship, strategic management, and the MBA dissertation writing. She has acquired certification from the Oman SME MOHE as a certified entrepreneur educator. You can uh, see her profile link on the screen. Moving ahead with the conference now. Uh, assistant professor from Middle East College, Muscat Oman. Um, I'm so privileged to be invited and to deliver uh, the keynote you know, speech for this uh, conference on the topic how artificial intelligence will transform the businesses. 
before examining how these uh, AI technologies are impacting the business world, it is important to define the terminology first. Uh, so this artificial intelligence is a, a very broad term that uh, refers to any type of computer software that engages uh, in human-like activities, so including learning, uh, planning, and uh, problem solving. So it refers to machine simulations of human intelligence processes, uh, particularly a computer system. So as stated in the title, I would like to uh, highlight here the most common areas of uh, AI in business and how it can be used to improve business processes. Well, we knew very well that uh, artificial intelligence can transform uh, businesses and industries by uh, streamlining processes, automating work, and increasing efficiency. Uh, AI offers convenience, uh, accessibility, automation, uh, efficiency, all directly related to achieving more productivity and enhancing user experience. Well, AI allows businesses to reach a larger audience and establish long-term customer relationship. This in turn creates customer loyalty and leading to a continuous revenue of for the company. And like other technologies, AI cannot work alone. The entire organization, including the, uh, the workforce, and the business structure needs to be a part of a single plan aligned with the company's objective. Uh, the future is coming uh, quickly and artificial intelligence will certainly be a part of it. As this technology develops, uh, the world will see new startups and numerous business applications and uh, consumer uses. Uh, the displacement of certain jobs and the creation of entirely new ones. Uh, along with the in Internet of Things, artificial intelligence has the potential to dramatically remake the economy, uh, but its exact impact remains to be seen. How AI is uh, uh, transforming the business sector, or shall we say, uh, what are the roles of uh, uh, AI in business or in businesses? Uh, from our basic understanding, so we understand that AI can be uh, used to analyze data and uh, make predictions, okay, automate tasks or operations, and help solve problems. Uh, artificial intelligence is a uh, key technology uh, for businesses and organizations uh, seeking to improve their operations and productivity. We knew very well that uh, AI in business can be uh, applied in uh, customer service, uh, marketing, sales, finance, uh, HR, IT, and many more. But uh, basically and specifically, AI is transforming the business sector in many ways. Okay, let's take this one by one as we've seen on the screen. Okay, first, uh, AI automate operations. Uh, AI can help businesses automate their uh, routine tasks and uh, free up the workforce for more critical and creative work. Uh, AI can also reduce human errors and ensure accuracy and efficiency. So for example, uh, the uh, AI powered chatbots can handle customer queries and provide information or assistance. Organizations have to perform hundreds of tasks daily, um, but AI will enable businesses to automate their routine operations and free up the workforce for, again, as I said, for more critical tasks. 
uh, this especially applies to uh, a customer support department. So instead of uh, uh, manually answering every customer query, uh, the employees can use AI uh, powered chatbots for uh, easy tickets and uh, focus on uh, complex support cases and marketing related tasks. Uh, AI can also um, minimize human errors and ensure accuracy. So as businesses keep automating their operations more and more, they will soon achieve a more efficient workforce and uh, quality output. Okay, next, uh, AI enhanced decision making. Okay, so AI can help of businesses analyze large amount of data uh, and can help in predictions and recommendations. Uh, sales forecasting. Um, AI can also help businesses optimize their processes, their strategies, their outcomes. Uh, so for example, uh, AI can help businesses forecast sales, uh, which normally have been happening in any business operations. Okay, so how much raw materials, um, I mean, to order uh, for a year, for a month, for a quarter, um, identify customer needs, okay, uh, so based on uh, the, the market availability of the marketing data, okay, and from there, um, make a personalized offer, okay. Um, we can see also that uh, on the third aspect, uh, AI improved customer experience. Uh, so with AI, uh, AI can help uh, businesses interact with their customers in a more engaging, uh, more convenient and um, more personalized ways. So AI can also help businesses understand customer behavior, uh, preferences, and feedback. As uh, for example, AI can help businesses provide voice assistance, uh, facial recognition, and uh, sentiment analysis. They also uh, AI um, assist businesses in uh, innovating uh, products and uh, services. So AI can help businesses create new and improved products and services that uh, meet customer uh, expectation and, and solve problems. Um, AI can also help businesses differentiate themselves from uh, uh, competitors and, and uh, create value. Yeah, because uh, of course, uh, data of the competitors can be can be retrieved and can be made available to any businesses, you know, uh, sales records, uh, previous sales last, uh, from previous years, you know, five years, 10 years, uh, can, be, can be retrieved and can be uh, collected right away uh, through AI. So you just, you know, uh, one click. And then you can have everything in it. And AI can even do, a, a, you know, a, 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 a present and analyze data, okay? So uh, again, there's this example of uh, uh, AI can help businesses offer smart devices, uh, the self-driving cars, yeah? And the virtual reality, okay? Uh, so another case of uh, how it assists business is uh, AI integrate industry knowledge. Okay, how these things happen, AI can help businesses leverage domain specific knowledge and expertise to enhance their performance and offerings. So AI can also help businesses to adapt to changing market conditions and uh, a customer demand. So, um, so for example, AI can help businesses on, on financial planning. And then again, as I said earlier, as a sales forecasting, um, legal analysis, 
so because those uh, previous legal uh, undertakings and documents can be retrieved quickly it can be made available okay so let's discuss uh, some of the businesses that have transformed operations uh, with AI so I just will consider these uh, five uh, most popular okay so we have the sales um, uh, and business development okay so company like Alibaba uses AI to uh, predict customer needs and create product descriptions okay so that's on the sales and business development and then um, travel and transportation so as we know that uh, transportation is uh, uh, integral to country's infrastructure so with the help of AI the identification of demand and supply gets easy and it is used in the transportation industry to improve passenger safety a register traffic congestions and, and many more so uh, the AI has assisted uber you know uh, in, in, in so many aspects and another example is the healthcare so AI is now involved in uh, in this industry so pharmaceutical companies take the help of AI in the research of life-saving medicines within last time, which after the uh, has resulted in the reduction of costs. And then on finance in this sector, AI plays an important role as it relies on real-time reporting, accuracy, and processing of large quantitative data. Uh, so they implement this machine learning into financial operations by implementing chatbots, automations, and algorithmic trading. And then we have document and identity verification. Uh, AI is a most recommended feature in identification and verification matters. Uh, this technology is really captured the type of IV document and perform face matching and all types of verification more easily than the human within a second. So now in conclusion, so I can see that as AI becomes more sophisticated and widespread, oh, its uh, effect on society will likely have positive and negative uh, effects as well. So that's we should understand AI and work together to shape its future. Um, AI and tools such as the ChatGPT are becoming increasingly significant in the business landscape, and the survey results indicate uh, indicated that businesses are adopting AI for a variety of applications. Um, on cybersecurity, uh, for one, a customer service, uh, for customer uh, relationship, and they are also focusing on improving customer experience through personalized services, so instant messaging, tailored advertising. And additionally, AI is enhancing internal business processes as well. Okay, so uh, I think I have shared uh, enough on uh, how AI uh, transform uh, businesses. And I would like to say thank you for uh, this opportunity for uh, sharing uh, this uh, uh, information uh, through this uh, keynote uh, talk in this conference okay uh, thank you and have a blessed day thank you so much dr maria for your wonderful presentation
I would like to request all the participants. If anyone has any questions related to Dr. Maria's presentation, they can ask her or put their questions in the chat box itself. Uh, Dr. Florin uh, Mobo, welcome to the conference. Could you hear me? Uh, Asmadi, welcome to the conference. I would like to request all the participants to turn on their webcams. Moving ahead with the conference now. This brings us to the end of session one. Now we will begin with uh, session two of the conference. Team activity and photo session. Let's proceed towards our team building activity. Sometimes we miss the opportunity of connection and linkage with fellow participants of the conference. This team activity is to encourage interaction among all the participants. One by one, we will share the views and solutions on the topic of discussion. And also we will be conducting a photo session during the same. So our today's topic of discussion is, should you trust your first impression? When this obnoxious guy sits next to you, he's loud, he spills his drink on you, and he makes fun of your team. Days later, you're walking in the park when suddenly it starts to pour rain. Who should show up at your side to offer you an umbrella? The same guy from the football game. Do you change your mind about him based on this second encounter? Or do you go with your first impression and write him off? Research in social psychology suggests that we're quick to form lasting impressions of others based on their behaviors. We manage to do this with little effort, inferring stable character traits from a single behavior, like a harsh word or a clumsy step. Using our impressions as guides, we can accurately predict how people are going to behave in the future. Armed with the knowledge the guy from the football game was a jerk the first time you met him, you might expect more of the same down the road. If so, you might choose to avoid him the next time you see him. That said, we can change our impressions in light of new information. Behavioral researchers have identified consistent patterns that seem to guide this process of impression updating. On one hand, learning very negative, highly immoral information about someone typically has a stronger impact than learning very positive, highly moral information. So, unfortunately for our new friend from the football game, his bad behavior at the game might outweigh his good behavior at the park. Research suggests that this bias occurs because immoral behaviors are more diagnostic or revealing of a person's true character. Okay, so by this logic, bad is always stronger than good when it comes to updating. Well, not necessarily. Certain types of learning don't seem to lead to this sort of negativity bias. When learning about another person's abilities and competencies, for instance, this bias flips. It's actually the positive information that gets weighted more heavily. Let's go back to that football game. If a player scores a goal, it ultimately has a stronger impact on your impression of their skills than if they miss the net. The two sides of the updating story are ultimately quite consistent. Overall, behaviors that are perceived as being less frequent are also the ones that people tend to weigh more heavily when forming and updating impressions. Highly immoral actions and highly competent actions. So, what's happening at the level of the brain when we're updating our impressions? Using fMRI, or functional magnetic resonance imaging, researchers have identified an extended network of brain regions that respond to new information that's inconsistent with initial impressions. These include areas typically associated with social cognition, attention, and cognitive control. Moreover, when updating impressions based on people's behaviors, activity in the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex and the superior temporal sulcus correlates with perceptions of how frequently those behaviors occur in daily life. In other words, the brain seems to be tracking low-level statistical properties of behavior in order to make complex decisions regarding other people's character. It needs to decide, is this person's behavior typical or is it out of the ordinary? In the situation with the obnoxious football fan turned Good Samaritan, your brain says, well, in my experience, pretty much anyone would lend someone their umbrella. 
but the way this guy acted at the football game, that was unusual. And so, you decide to go with your first impression. There's a good moral in this data. Your brain, and by extension you, might care more about the very negative, immoral things another person has done compared to the very positive, moral things, but it's a direct result of the comparative rarity of those bad behaviors. We're more used to people being basically good, like taking time to help a stranger in need. In this context, bad might be stronger than good, but only because good is more plentiful. Think about the last time you judged someone based on their behavior, especially a time when you really feel like you changed your mind about someone. Was the behavior that caused you to update your impression something you'd expect anyone to do? Or was it something totally out of the ordinary? So this was our group discussion activity. Uh, I would like to ask uh, everyone to share their views and opinions on this act, uh, group dis topic of uh, discussion. Uh, I would like to request everyone to unmute their mics and start your cameras. Uh, Dr. Maria, would you like to add your views and opinions regarding this topic of discussion? Well, yeah. Uh, okay, so this is about impression. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I agree. Actually, uh, uh, well, we we have the saying: the first impression lasts. Yeah. Okay. So we are always on. Yeah, we put ourselves on our best. <laughs> That's normally the case. So every time we meet somebody, you know, the first time. Because this always stick to our mind that whatever they've seen from us on on the first meeting, and of course that will stay, okay. And of course at some point in time that should something happen, it stayed in me on my end. Uh okay, it, it stays with me no matter what, okay. Because there will be cases that yeah, in the in, in the course of trans, uh, having a transaction, whatever it is, academic business things happen. Yeah. Uh, because uh, we've been influenced by so many things. So, uh, I mean, uh, the first meeting is just based on internal, but there's so many things that affect our interaction, okay? Uh, both internal and external. So, okay, internally, it's our mood. Uh, but for me, uh, the first impression always stay because I myself are being affected internally by my mood, by mood externally by people around us. But... Uh, in my, uh, it's me. I mean, I can, I should say I'm a good person, something like that. You know, if something happened that I, 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 I acted in, in different to somebody, well, at the end of the day, uh, you think about it, you evaluate yourself that you would like, you say, say, say sorry, because you're saying it's not you. So those kind of things stays with me when something happened to uh, somebody, I mean, uh, that I'm interacting with. Uh, the best, the best thing always stays with me. I, I never judge. Okay, that's that's it. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Maria, for sharing yeah. your views. Uh, Moj Zednat, would you like to add your views, share your views and opinions with us? Okay. Well, first of all, I, I just want to uh, thank. Uh, the presenter for a very animated and, and interesting discussion. Uh, I've always been interested in uh, the um, um, uh, uh, neuro neurobio neurobiological aspects of uh, social and emotional behavior and uh, trying to pin down the specific substrates of certain behaviors and certain certain emotions. Uh, Recent review uh, in the, uh, the emotions show that it's really, really difficult to identify individual um, uh, um, uh, anatomical uh, physiological areas that are related to you know, uh, discrete emotions and apparently uh, they're, they're parallel uh, processes at, at, uh, um, at play when, when we're talking about a specific emotion, whether it be anger or guilt or envy or or what have you and i i think that in terms of social behavior we also have to look at some of the uh, uh hormonal aspects of course uh oxytocin and, and and so forth so i think it's uh very very uh 
interesting and, and thought provoking uh, the the uh, the talk. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, sharing your opinion on the video. Uh, Dr. Zareen, would you like to share your uh, views on the topic of discussion? Yes, hello everyone. Uh, regarding it's a community workshop at the same time. So okay. I'm just sharing here. And uh, with regards to meeting someone in fresh, the first impression depends really on the observation where you are meeting someone, um, understanding the verbal language, non-verbal language of the person, and also sharing the the, the, the aura that the person also is, is giving you the type of of uh, positive or negative thoughts at the same time. All these will matter, depending on whether it is a professional or a personal meeting, depending what type of friendship also we share, the type of personality as well. So all these will depend on the situation. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Zareen, for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, <laughs> Ahmed said, G, uh, would you like to share your uh, views and opinions on the topic of the discussion? Ahmed? Could you hear me? Uh, Asma Diye? Can you share your uh, views? Yeah. On, on, on the... Sorry, I'm not really <laughs> focusing on the... Uh, but I think the most of the discussions on the first impression, right? Yeah. You know, you meet someone. Mm. Especially, uh, I think... Uh, it's always uh, like uh, we are academicians, right? We are always interested to expand, mm -hmm. to enhance our networking. So I think, uh, of course, this is a, it's a good step, actually. We need to be positive, always positive, uh, because it will give us some kind of uh, positive mood I mean, in terms of creating a very inter interactive discussions. So I think I I strongly agree. I mean, first impression is is is, is just to give some uh, very good positive impressions to everyone. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for you sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, Ahmed, could you hear me now? Would you like to share your views and opinions on the uh, topic of discussion? Yes, hello everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for organizing this uh, conference. And uh, I would like to thank all professor for their great presentations. And for the topic that we want, want to discuss, I think first impression we have in Arab say, stay a long time. So if you have, uh, but I think we have to be careful, especially for us who work in field of education, as teacher, as professors. We have students. We sometimes we say that okay, this student is very really bad, and maybe this student will change in the future. You see what I mean? So this first impression should be changed. Not like should we should be positive. Not should be like uh, okay, this impression and stay. No, we may uh, we may uh, change our opinion uh, later. This is my. Uh, uh, opinion on this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ahmed, for sharing your views. Uh, so to conclude with the group discussion activity, I would like to say that uh, most of um, it it is like it's not it's not uh, uh, compulsory that our first impression will always be the uh, general opinion of that person, and uh, maybe the person is different from what we are seeing as his first impression or his or her first impression. So we can't judge uh, judge a person based uh, on, the, on the basis of that because as we know, uh, do not judge a book by its cover. So I personally, I feel that uh, we need to observe a per person for a bit so that we can know how that person is or how that, uh, uh, how the, uh, Dr. Zareen quoted that uh, it's also important that what kind of vibe we are getting from the person, it's also necessary that. So thank you for the group discussion activity and thank you all for participating in the activity. So I would like to request everyone to turn on their webcam for the photo session activity now. Uh, Asmadi, uh, would you like, uh, can you turn on your webcam for the photo session activity? Yeah.
thank you so much everyone for participating actively in the conference welcome so moving ahead with the conference now this brings us all to the end of session 2 that is the group discussion and session activity now we will move ahead with the session 3 of the conference that is the technical talk so our first presenter of the day is uh, mosh zednar faculty of education university of haifa israel topic his topic of presentation is the dilemma of teaching self regulated learning skills to talented students i would like to request all the participants to read the abstract from the screen okay so moving ahead with the presentation now Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, greetings from afar. Uh, I'd like to talk a bit about the dilemma of teaching self-regulated teaching skills, commonly uh, 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 referred to by the acronym SRL, to talented and gifted uh, students. Um, I, some of the experts in education may not be entirely conversant or up to date. with uh, current research on SRL uh, basically in general or SRL in talent and students in particular um therefore the aim of this paper is is basically threefold first to briefly define SRL and its key components second to uh briefly sketch uh and lay out what is known about teaching SRL to classroom students uh, in a very cursory manner And finally, to discuss whether or not talented uh, students actually need to be instructed in SRL. Well, uh, what is SRL? Um, SRL is an active, constructive process whereby learners set goals for their learning, and then attempt to monitor, regulate, and control their cognition, motivation, and behavior, guided and constrained by their goals and the contextual features. in the environment this definition was first proposed by Paul Pintridge whom you see here and uh, he has a wonderful paper in our uh, handbook um, on handbook of self regulation which is edited by uh, Monique Baker's Paul Pintridge and uh your um self regulated students are generally characterized as efficiently managing their own learning through goal setting monitoring strategy use um self evaluating their achievement um as you see in this uh schematic uh, uh diagram uh, there are three major facets here the first facet is forethought even before actually engaging in a learning or testing situation um this includes self assessment uh what do i know about the material uh what are my incoming behaviors and so forth goal setting what am i going to get out of this learning uh uh situation um how am i going to go about in achieving these goals and uh how uh, certain am i that i have the wherewithal to actually um do what's needed to succeed here uh we move on from here to performance which is basically uh self regulation during the task and uh, implementation of those strategies that were formalized in the forethought um uh, phase and the next facet is self reflection after the uh, learning task or achievement task or assessment task um uh students uh, uh monitor uh, their outcomes uh, they want to see to what extent uh, they've achieved what they plan to achieve Uh, how well did they do to what the, do they attribute their success or failures uh over the past few decades both behavioral and social cognitive theories have been successfully applied to help students learn self-regulated behaviors 
So teachers in the modern classroom and during homework activities now regularly introduce key facets of the SRL process. Uh, students regularly receive explicit training by teachers in goal setting, strategy use, self monitoring, and uh, systemic practice in classroom settings. Uh, students are taught how to analyze tasks in front of them, um, set effective goals for their uh, study, learning, uh, testing, choose the most appropriate strategy to uh, achieve these goals, self instruct to teach themselves. Um, how to uh, uh, manage their learning, self-judge, see how well they, they're doing, reinforce their attainments, and furthermore, teachers can mediate SRL strategies by demonstrating the use and effectiveness of various SRL techniques. So basically, teachers uh, instruct students to do a number of things. Um, have a look here, Just I won't go into all of them. Um, anywhere from assessing the requirements of the task at hand, um, assessing their current knowledge, deciding on effective strategies, uh, self-appraising their performance, um, attempting to attribute performance to internal changeable and controllable factors, and decide what needs to be done to improve future performance. I'll leave this here for a minute so you can assimilate some of the things um, that may be helpful to you in the future in, in working with students who uh, need these uh, self-regulatory strategies. Okay. Uh, research uh, by a number of scholars such as late uh, Barry Zimmerman and, and Martinez uh, Pons suggest that SRL can actually uh, be improved when instructional methods and environmental conditions support the use of a set of strategies directed towards the optimization of several factors. These include personal functioning, academic behavioral performance, and learning environment. So SRL may be facilitated via uh, environmental conditions that provide students with opportunities to make choices, exercise volitional control, participate in assessments, engage in complex tasks, and seek help. Uh, environmental conditions such as the organization of materials and clear expectations from teachers or mentors support the development and use of SRL strategies in teaching various skills. Uh, in fact, teachers who use explicit instruction and modeling of SRL strategies have more students who can use self-regulation strategies to study for longer periods and can respond to higher order thinking questions. Um, another important factor in, in self regulated learning are the properties of the goals uh, that are um, in, in front of the teacher student. A number of goal properties, and we know this from um, goal theory and, and motivation research, a number of goal properties are especially effective for negotiating long-term tax, particularly the proximity of the goal, the nearer the goal, the better. Adequate difficulty level, a goal that's not too easy and not too difficult for the student is ideal. The specificity of the goal, how specific you can formulate the goal rather than something very general, such as a, I hope to uh, get a handle on, 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 on uh, calculus, it's probably better to uh, specify that I, I want to learn how to um, um, uh, determine the uh, um, uh, specific uh, uh, differentiation of a, a function. Um, so accordingly, students can learn how to break up long-term complex assignments. Uh, for example, penning a term paper in European or Asian history into short-term manageable tasks that's really crucial. So learners can be more readily accomplish the subtasks. <clears throat> and by completing each subtask, 
students develop their self-efficacy by eventually producing an organized and generally high-quality paper. Students who judge their learning process as inadequate can ask their teachers for assistance so the teachers can instruct these students in a more efficient strategy, can then use to more effectively promote their learning uh, students, in fact. Um, uh, how effective uh, are SRL strategies when used in the classroom by qualified teachers? Well, a wide body of research has assessed the effectiveness of various strategy instructional procedures. Lynn Corno has uh, been very active in this area. Uh, she was former editor of Educational Psychology. In the review of interventions aiming at the improvement of student learning, Hattie and, and colleagues concluded way back in uh, 1996 that most SR strategy interventions were indeed effective. They also found evidence for the near transfer of learning, that is, the transfer of learning to tasks that are closely related to the original learning task. Now, the question I'd like to pose before you is, should we uh, teach SR skills to talented and gifted students? I'd like you to take a moment and um, reach some sort of uh, decision, whether it's appropriate or inappropriate, ineffective, useless, and, and effective, uh, and so forth, and, and try to provide perhaps rationale or, or reasons for that. Well, a major dilemma facing teachers in gifted education is whether or not their talented and high ability students actually need to be instructed in SRL skills. If so, should instruction be tailored to their specific needs and talents, or should instruction be no different from instructional strategies designed for their non-identified counterparts? So, uh, well, let's look at uh, both sides of the dilemma, both horns of the dilemma. One can argue, for example, that SRL strategies and interventions for gifted and talented learners shouldn't be ostensibly different, basically, from those instructional strategies designed for use among typical learners. It would seem important to enhance and strengthen useful skills and help students, not using them to their benefit, realize how they would benefit from employing SRL strategies in their learning. Now, on the other hand, one may argue, perhaps it's useless. There's no need to teach talented, uh, high-ability students. They themselves are talented, perhaps, in part, because they know how to, inherently know how to use these strategies. They frequently succeed in school without deliberately using them in our academic learning, for example. Uh, some researchers uh, have suggested that many academically talented students fail to recognize the use of those SRL strategies because they tend to do well over, over time, especially in, in mixed ability classes without self-regulating their learning. Uh, this was proposed by uh, Heidrun Steger, a colleague of mine uh, in this area. Thus, perhaps, these talented students do not require special instruction in the use of SRL school, uh, skills. In addition, metacognitive skills have been said to be a, sign a significant signature strength of academically talented students, and research suggests they are better at using these metacognitive strategies than other counterparts. Um, so, um, in order to resolve this dilemma, it's imperative to take the learning context into consideration. Uh, specifically, it stands to reason that SRL becomes important for talented and high ability learners who are working towards excellence and are being challenged in a particular talent domain. So it makes a difference whether SRL competencies are taught to groups of talented learners in challenging learning settings or to individual talented learners in inclusive or mixed ability settings. Perhaps less important mixed ability, more important challenging uh, gifted classes. Uh, and it's important to consider the difficulty level of the task to be negotiated because uh, automatizing self-regulated uh, skills can actually free up some working memory. Um, so we conclude by noting that studies indicate that learners need to invest about 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to achieve excellence. 
Uh, this rule of thumb holds relatively independently of Lure's level of talent and the talent domains. So during this process, educational agents play a prominent role in the course of expertise acquisition. Nevertheless, such extensive learning process can't be optimally designed without SL. So according to this pro teacher of the gifted, to make sure the gifted learners begin training their SL companies when engaged in cognitive tasks as early as possible. And of course, don't limit your challenges. Challenge your limits. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I would like to request all the participants, if anyone has any questions related to his presentation, they can ask him. Anyone, any questions? Okay. So uh, if anyone arises with any questions, they can put their questions in the chat box itself. Uh, before that, I would like to thank Mo Zednar for your wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for attending the conference today. And uh, it's a great, mm -hmm. great pleasure to have you with us today. So moving ahead with the conference now, our next presenter of the day is Bibi John Muslim Zareen Nishan, Department of Mauritian and Area Studies, Mahatma Gandhi Institute, Moka, Mauritius. Her topic of presentation is Gender-Based Violence Amid COVID-19 Pandemic, a Qualitative Study in Mauritius. I would like to request all the participants to read the abstract from the screen. No. Moving ahead with the conference now. Hello everyone. First of all, I thank Eurasia Research for allowing me and accepting my research proposal and abstract to be presented in the conference. My study is on the impact of COVID-19 lockdowns on gender-based violence, the challenges faced by women victims in Mauritius. So gender-based violence, as we know, is a phenomenon which is strongly embedded in different societies around the world. It is one of the main violations of human rights and aims at targeting one person primarily due to their gender. Both men and women are victims, but no one Harmful behaviors associated with GBV are physical, verbal, emotional, and sexual abuse of the wife, undernourishment of girls and daughters, women and girls forced into sex work, female genital mutilation, amongst others. The violence can also be psychological in the sense that women feel excluded from the society among their friends, families, and social the UN has labelled GBV as a global issue in terms of health and development and has highlighted the need to put in place policies, programs, sensitization campaigns all around the world with a view to preventing violence against women. Therefore, GBV is also associated with not only morbidity and mortality of women, but also health complications and implications for themselves and their children. Violence against women occurs around the world, regardless of race, color, creed, and community. The COVID-19 pandemic has resurfaced existing inequalities, whether it is in the socioeconomic or cultural systems around the world, and we have witnessed a rise in the number of cases of GVB during the emergency quarantine. In a situation where half of the world population were confined to the four walls of the house, the rate of gender-based violence had increased drastically in almost all the countries, as you can see the figures in the slides. Mauritius, at the same time, a small country in the Indian Ocean was unspared from the global epidemic of gender-based violence. So we do have a lot of cases of violence domestic violence, intimate partner violence in the country, urging the different stakeholders to take actions to prevent the cases from rising up. 
Due to the fact that Mauritius is a highly patriarchal society, the country has also witnessed a number of passionate crimes in the last decade. Not only that, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen a rise in the number of GBV cases. Only 18 days, there were an increase of 293 reported cases of GBV in Mauritius, the underreported cases being unknown. The victims had no choice to stay, but with their perpetrators, 520 cases were reported to the family police unit during the first lockdown, 39 of which were male victims and 481 were female victims. Around 111 female victims had to be placed in a shelter during the lockdown as their lives were in danger. So all these are indications of the vulnerability of women and girls, especially in a patriarchal setting. So the key to preventing domestic violence is therefore changing the attitudes and behavior conducive to this form of violence. Consequently, this study examines the lived experiences of women victims of GBV amid the COVID-19 pandemic. The researcher identifies the main factors causing GVB in Mauritius during the lockdown, examines the victim's knowledge of GBV and its implications, as well as investigates on the coping strategies that victims use in their daily routine. It is also important to note that Mauritius had witnessed two lockdowns, one being a full lockdown and the second one a partial one. With the literature, we find a lot of information regarding definitions, uh, regarding figures, facts and figures around the world, also and in Mauritius. So domestic violence is defined by the WHO as the use of force, physical strength on another person or another group of individuals that result to mental health problems and injuries. With regards to gender-based violence, it is mainly on a one-to-one -one basis, that is either from husband to wife and wife to husband or partners. So gender-related deaths have increased drastically from 2019 to 2020 across the world due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Here we have some figures in the Western Pacific, Mediterranean Ocean and the Southeast Asia. The pandemic had impacted on families worldwide, both economically and socially. Among the different forms, we also have STDs, burns and bruises, injuries, pelvic inflammatory diseases, and menstrual irregularities. Among the psychological problems are post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, insomnia, increased substance abuse, self-harm, and suicidal thoughts. According to the UN, GBV had increased drastically due to economic stress and uncertainty among people, couples with restricted movement and isolation. Thus, GBV is one of the main challenges of women's health and well-being. Methodology the current study employed an exploratory qualitative method among victims who encountered gender-based violence amid the COVID-19 lockdown. While exploring human actions and experiences which cannot be quantified, qualitative approach was, mo was deemed most appropriate for the study. It was conducted in a shelter where the victims were brought after the intervention of the police and family support during the confinement. Qualitative approach was also appropriate for a study of this nature because it gives in-depth information and details of the phenomena being studied. The method allowed for the opportunity to provide insight into the world of the participants in their own language and promote self-disclosure in a friendly and environmental, confidential environment. 13 victims who faced GBV amid the COVID-19 pandemic were selected using the snowball sampling technique. They were interviewed using the semi-structured in-depth interviews approach. The participants were aged between 23 to 48 years. An open-ended interview schedule was used to guide 
discussions within the participants. Along with the in-depth interviews, focus group discussions were carried out among family protection officers from the Ministry of Gender Equality, Child Development and Family Welfare and Police Family Protection Unit. The guiding questions for the officers consisted mainly about how, what type of support they would provide to the victims and the emergency measures they adopted. So immediately after each interview, the data was transcribed and translated into English. The data was then analyzed thematically using Brown's and Clark thematic analysis, which consisted of the following steps. Becoming familiar with the data, generating the goals and themes, reviewing the themes and defining them. The main themes identified from the in-depth interviews with the GBV victims are economic insecurity, increased anxiety and depression, lack of support systems, health complications, stigma, guilt and discrimination. In the following slides, we are going to look at one by one the different themes. Economic insecurity. The majority of women interviewed encountered problems with their jobs and had unstable income. They were either working in private, informal sector, the tourism sector, or they had small businesses. The respondents had no choice to stay at home and were thus financially dependent on their husbands. Some had loosened their jobs and their contracts were, were not renewed. Anxiety and depression. Another recurrent theme encountered in this study is about anxiety and depression that the victims of GBV faced amid the COVID-19 pandemic. One respondent, Rani, mentioned that she was always in a state of constant fear because her husband would become very violent at any moment. Another participant, Lama, stated, My children and myself were witnessing my husband's harsh and foul words on a permanent basis. We had to obey his orders and he would beat us if we didn't reply to his commands. This was really stressful and we were quite depressed. I say in the literature, Rod et al. revealed that time during the pandemic had come to a standstill and this was associated with increased challenges of depression, anxiety, symptoms, which can be worse for the GBV victims. Another theme came out from this study was health complications. The victims of GBV, women in particular, revealed that they experienced a lot of challenges and barriers to have access to their routine health care, as well as taking their medications regularly. One respondent, Juhi, from the current study mentioned that she couldn't buy her medications once her stock was over. Her husband, a, never, a, a drug addict, was never concerned with, what, with that, and as a result, both her diabetes and blood pressure levels would rise. She felt unwell, dizzy, but she had no choice than to manage without her medications. Thus, we see a heightened risk of negative health complications due to lack of health care support from partner's husband, and economic problems for women, typically during the pandemic. Stigma, self-blame and guilt. Stigma in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic is also an ongoing phase of self-blame and tolerance for gender-based violence victims. In the current study, the majority of the respondents reported that they had absolutely no support from other family members when they face either physical or psychological abuse from their partners or husbands. This is considered as normal, as we have seen in the literature where Mauritius is a highly patriarchal society in nature, so violence against women is not really voiced out. The victims are sometimes even blamed for their behavior and physical appearance, causing them to internalize the guilt and accept the blame. They feel stigmatized due to their sufferings and are discouraged to voice out. The majority of respondents in the study talked about being blamed by their in-laws whenever they would face violent behaviors, thus encouraging the perpetrators to continue harming their victims, either physically or psychologically. Another theme was lack of support systems. 
The majority of GBV victims reported that they lacked support in all its forms during the lockdown. They were confined to the four walls of the house. Shelters were almost closed. They wouldn't have access to basic amenities and felt helpless. They had only hotlines where they would call the family police unit and officers from the ministry could attend to only by phone and no visits were allowed during the lockdown period. Results from the FDGs with the personal. The police officers revealed that they had many cases of gender-based violence to deal with during the pandemic. However, the available support was only free hotline. The majority of victims could not be relocated because the police didn't, re didn't receive the orders. The confinement orders were very strict and there were no choice but to adhere to the rules and regulation. One police state officer stated, We received several calls where the victims were enduring physical violence. We tried to talk to them and even went to their residence but could not do more. In a few cases, where the lives of the victims were in danger, we had to issue protection orders. The Family Welfare Protection Officer from the Ministry of Gender then would accompany to take the victims to some shelters which were operating under strict guidance. The data revealed that the focus group discussion showed there were some shelters operating during the lockdown period, but under strict surveillance. The Family Welfare Protection Officer were involved in the case and they accompanied the victims from their residence to the shelters. They were equipped with the Work Access Permit, WAP, and had frequent visits to the victims' residence. However, the officers also revealed that the COVID-19 lockdown were very stressful. They had to work under harsh conditions, risking their lives, being exposed to the virus, and they were very concerned concentrated for their fa concern for their families who were also at risk. On a conclusive note, we've seen in this paper that the GBV victims have been facing numerous challenges during the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown. The main themes emerging from this study are economic security, insecurity, anxiety and depression, health complications and mental health problems, stigma and self-blame and lack of support systems. The FDGs with the personnel revealed the absence of support to GBV victims during the confinement period. There is thus a need to have a more holistic approach towards emergency crises such as COVID-19 lockdown in the future. A preparedness plan or a backup plan for all institutions relating to GBV such as healthcare professionals, psychologists, counsellors, the court, the justice system and the family police unit. I thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Zareen, uh, for your wonderful presentation. If any of the participants have any questions related to her presentation, they can ask her or put their questions in the chat box itself. Anyone, any questions? Okay. So, thank you so much uh, once again, Dr. Zareen, for your wonderful presentation. Moving ahead with the conference now. Our next presenter of the day is Asmedi Idris, International Relations Program, Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities, University Malaysia Sabah, UMS, Kota Kinabuli, Sabah, Malaysia. His topic of presentation is The Role of Monarchy Institution in Sustaining Political Stability, The Case of Sabah. I would like to request all the participants to read the abstract from the screen. Moving ahead with this video presentation. Okay, very good uh, uh, morning, but uh, uh, very good uh, afternoon from uh, Malaysia. 
now uh, the time in Malaysia is uh, close to 4 p.m. So I think without further ado, I would like to share my slides. Okay, my uh, presentation today is about the role of monarchy institutions in sustaining uh, political stability, the case of Sabah. So my name is uh, Asma Didris, I should Professor Dr. Asma Didris, and this is my colleagues, Marja Azima Omar, Rizal Zamani Idris, Suzali Muhammad, Hothi Sarjono, Sharudin Haji Awa Ahmad, Rahmat Yalanchi, and we are all from University of Malaysia Sabah. This uh, paper is uh, uh, research, uh, this is from our research grant uh, from the university. So once again, thank you very much for the organizer of the social social science and humanities research, research association, the International Conference of Dubai, uh, because uh, accepting our paper. So for introductions, uh, this paper analyzes the role of monarchy in sustaining political stability. Uh, the focus is on the institutions of Tuan Yang Tautama and short term TYT, Yang Diputuan Negeri Sabah, which represent Yang Diputuan Agung Malaysia. Since 1963 until today, TYT institution has played a significant role in ensuring the political stability of Sabah. Problem statement and research uh, methods. The role of and functions of TYT is normally ceremonial, just like uh, a king. Eh? Okay, uh, the function is uh, largely ceremonial. However, when Sabah is facing political uncertainty, especially if uh, there's no political party uh, could win with majority seats in the state elections. So TYT's mediating and advising role is really needed. Hence, uh, this is the main aim of this paper, to analyze the role of TYT as representative of Yang Diputuan Agung at the state level in calming political uncertainty and to help forming a stable state government. This is a qualitative study using both the documentary analysis and interviews. Conceptual framework. Malaysia is one of the sovereign countries that embracing a constitutional, constitutional monarch as a form of government. A constitutional monarch government simply can, de can be defined as a system of government where a monarch shares power with a constitutionally organized government. The monarch may play the role as a de facto head of state or merely act as a ceremonial leader. For Malaysia, Indipulon Agung or YDP Agung is the supreme head of the federations and it is elected by the Conference of Rulers for a term of five years. YDP Agung has some specific executive powers but shall act in accordance with advice of the cabinet or of a minister acting under the general authority of the cabinet. Among the principal functions of YDP Agung with the cabinet's advice are the appointment of a prime minister, the resolution of parliament and the requisitions of meeting of the Conference of Rulers. For Sabah, is one of the 14 states in Malaysia, as stipulated in Part 2 of the Sabah Constitution, Tuan Yang Tautama in Tuan Negeri Sabah or TYT, as excellent, the head of state is the official head of state. Unlike the peninsula states, Sabah and Sarawak don't have hereditary royal lineage, and in lieu of such, the governor, that is the TYT, is, is elected, and it is also is the representative of the Yang Diputuan Agung. Basically, the role of the TYT is largely ceremonial, ceremonial as I said before, as it reflects the constitutional framework within which the federations of Malaysia. As the head of state, the TYT is bound by the state, by the Sabah state institution to carry out several constitutional responsibilities in the executive branch. One pivotal duty of the TYT is to appoint the chief minister of Sabah, oftentimes the leader of the majority party or coalition in the state legislative assembly. Article 6 of Sabah Constitutions. Political state, uh, political uncertainty, uncertainty in Sabah after state elections. Undeniably, Sabah had been facing political uncertainty a few times, especially based on the results of the three state elections in 1985, 1994, and 2018. The reason for this was because the reserve thin majority achieved by a winning political party, which indirectly led to political instability. This was what happened in the post-restate election 
1995-1994 in 2018, where party hopping occurred and unavoidably TYT had to intervene to ensure the political stability sustained in Sabah. This is one, one of the uh, crucial moments for Sabah because uh, Sabah, uh, in what I say, three times after the state elections, where we having some political uncertainties, I mean, we cannot form a stable government. So that's why the role of TYT is really needed to make sure uh, our political stability is sustained in Sabah. And then uh, political scenario after 1985 state election. This is the first example. In the 1985 state election, Parti Bersatu Sabah won with, won with a thin majority, 20, only 25 seats from 48 seats. But uh, although uh, PBS uh, secure uh, a bit majority, but he, it couldn't secure Chief Minister post. Instead, to Mustafa, uh, combination of his party, Osno and Party Berjaya, uh, he was surprisingly appointed as new Chief Minister. So, due to the federal fortress, the federal government unhappy, TYT replaced to Mustafa with Tatu Pirate. In other words, uh, state election 1985, TYT had to appoint twice Chief Minister in ensuring political stability achieved in Sabah. And then come uh, post-1994 state election, as in 1985, PBS once again won with a thin majority, winning as exactly 1985, 25 seats from 48 seats. And then during this election, PBS faced new rival, Amnu Barisan National, which obtained 23 seats. That to Pirin sworn in as Chief Minister, but due to the fake. That to Pirin sworn in as Chief Minister after the state election, but due to the defections of some members, some PBS members, due to an Amno, the two parents' government collapsed. Tuati once again had to appoint uh, twice a chief minister. And then post-2018 state election, political drama happened again after the uh, 2018 state election. In this uh, election, both Sabah Barisan National being led by Amno and Warisan Party secured 29 seats respectively. Then BN uh, secured a uh, former state government by obtaining two more seats from the Star Party. And Dato Musa Aman, as the president, as the chair, chairman of the BN Sabah, was reappointed as the chief minister. But due to some defections from BN, especially the Afku Party, which declared a support to Warisan Party, Datu Musa lost his post. TYT had given uh, his green light by appointing Datu Sri Shafi Abdal as the new Chief Minister of Sabah. Based on this 2018 state election, TYT had people to rule to sustain political, sub political stability in Sabah. In other words, based on these three cases, TYT had to appoint Chief Minister twice in order to ensure that a political uh, stability is sustained. As a conclusion, several conclusions can be drawn. Firstly, the TYT plays a pivotal role in the appointment and removal of the Chief Minister. In both the 1985 and 1994 political crisis, the TYT had to exercise the authority to design it and dismiss the Chief Minister. This underscores the TYT's influence in resolving political conflicts in determining the leadership of the state government. Secondly, it is evident that on occasion the TYT's decisions are somehow influenced by political considerations. The political crisis of 1985 highlighted that the appointment and removal of the Chief Minister was subject to influence by the Deputy Prime Minister Musa Hamad. This indicates that the TYT's decision may not always be entirely independent and can be influenced by political pressures or influential uh, figures. Thirdly, the TYT's involvement in addressing political crisis can carry substantial implications. The 1985 crisis triggered a re-election in which the previous party emerged as the winner, while the 1994 crisis led to the TYT affording the Barisan National Coalition the opportunity to establish a government formed by defection within PBS. These instances underscore that the TYT's choices can shape the political landscape and have enduring ramifications for the state's government governance. 
it, it is conceivable that the reason behind the TYT sanction was to safeguard harmonious federal state relations. Finally, the TYT's role extends beyond mere ceremonial duties. This event emphasized the TYT's active involvement in resolving political crises, making critical decisions regarding chief minister appointments, and influencing the formation of the government. This underscores that the TYT's position in Sabah goes beyond symbolism and encompasses substantial decision making powers, especially during the crucial moments of appointing the chief minister in the 1985, 1984, and 2018 state election. That's all from me. Thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, good opportunity to share our research findings uh, which is the case of Sabah and in uh, especially the role of monarchy uh, for the Sabah case is the TYT which represent the, our king the young diplomat so on that note thank you very much and again see you in the future thank you bye salam thank you so much uh, for the wonderful presentation Asma Idris Yes, thank you very much. So, if no any problem. participants, if any participants have any questions related to uh, Asmandi's presentation, they can ask him or put their questions in the chat box. <laughs> Anyone, any questions? Okay. So, moving ahead with the conference now. So, uh, this brings us to the end of session three of the conference. Uh, there are some of the uh, patient listeners of this conference are Ahmad Said Al Gamadi, University of Technology, Malaysia, Johor, Bahuru, Malaysia. And one more listener uh, who has joined us today is Thamir Al Katarne, Department of Biology, University of Corona, Akuruna, Spain. Now, this brings us to the end of the conference. I would like to thank all the participants who have actively participated in, the, in this conference. With great pleasure and enthusiasm, I would like to conclude that the conference was a great success. Many people have contributed in, the, in this conference in different ways to turn this event into a smoothly learning conference with interesting presentations. This conference has related, uh, resulted in good discussions and networking. I owe my gratitude to all the presenters and patient listeners of this conference, to all the coordinators and the whole staff of Eurasia Research for their constant support. I would also like to thank all the universities and institutes who have sponsored our participants directly or indirectly and contributed in the smooth conduct of this conference. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, so before ending with this conference, I would like to ask Welcome. for uh, the feedback of the participants. So uh, Asmandi, any feedback for us uh, for this conference? Thank you. Uh, it is, I think it's a, a very good experience for me because I'm from I think Southeast Asian eh, in this okay. conference, I think. <laughs> and then I, I met, uh, as, as you said, this uh, our first impressions eh, yeah. and the anim animations. So I think it's, it's good. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for the uh, organizers to accept, accept our papers. And then, uh, yeah, I think we, hopefully we'll continue to collaborate in this uh, beautiful academic world. Thank you very much, uh, Thank you. Mr. Dibia. Yeah, see you again. Thank you so much, Aspendi. Uh, Moj Zedna, uh, would you like to share your feedback with us? Mosh, could you hear me? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Divya, for doing such a wonderful job in moderating this uh, exciting session and look forward to future conferences and seeing you all in person at the next meeting. Thank you so much for your wonderful feedback. Dr. Maria, would you like to share your feedback with us? Okay, uh, well, I, I have written <laughs> what I said about, about it's it's well organized. Okay, uh, it was well done. You Thank coordinated you. it well, Vivia. Congratulations, Vivia. So First, congratulations to our, uh, our organizer. And we'll be happy to see you again. We'll participate in, uh, in the next conference. I'm going to have my paper, of course. That's for sure. Okay, thank you and take care. Thank you take so care. much. Bye. Uh, Dr. Zarin, would you like to share your feedback? 
Yes, thanks a lot for allowing me and giving me the opportunity to present my paper. As always, uh, it's very, I'm very always enthusiastic to join Eurasia's conferences. It's my third uh, time I'm presenting at the Eurasia conference. And thank you very much for this wonderful organization and the very much smooth running of everything. And uh, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to the organizing team the committee, the organizers, thank you a lot. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Zareen, for your positive feedback. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, Ahmed mm -hmm. Said, uh, would you like to share your feedback with us? Yeah, uh, I would like to say again, thank you so much for uh, organizing this uh, conference. And I hope the next time we can see each other physically. And uh, maybe even the online is a great opportunity to uh, be with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for being a great enthusiast in the conference. So before ending the conference, I would like to mention that uh, Eurasia Research conducts conferences around the world, and some of the upcoming conferences are given on your screen. In November, we are organizing uh, conferences in Singapore, London, and Kuala Lumpur. In December uh, 2023, Bangkok and Bali. And in January 2024, we are organizing conferences in Paris and Tokyo. So I would like to request everyone to please refer these conferences to your friends and colleagues and to researchers who are looking for entering the research world through conferences and through academic networking. Thank you so much everyone today for patiently being uh, uh, in this conference till the last. Thank you everyone. Have a great day ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Have a great day. Thank you. Same to you.